How do I find the right keywords for my book? Or how do I even start writing a book in the first place? These questions and more are answered in the new Chapter One podcast, Ask Me Anything video series, available on YouTube. In these videos, I'm going to be answering your literary questions about media, marketing, publishing, and technology. So think about anything you've ever wanted to know about writing, publishing, and promoting a book, and then send those questions to info at ch1podcast.com. To access these videos, just click the link in the show notes or search for Chapter One Podcast on YouTube. And now, on to the show. Charles E. Smith, the name of the book is Journal of a Fast Track Life and Lessons Learned Along the Way. This is a book that uh, tries to approach lessons that I've learned in almost a half century of life and leadership positions in three different professions. Uh, I, I remembered something that one of my English teachers told me when I was an undergraduate at the University of Tennessee. She told the class one day that uh, there's a book within everyone. It's just a question of how you tell it and the way you tell it. Then later, when I was in graduate school, another English professor made a comment one day in class that stuck with me and said, if anyone's thinking about someday writing an autobiography, you need to keep in mind that unless your name is George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and people like that, you're probably not going to do too well. After I got down the road about 20 years and I began to realize there might be in me a book, I thought, well, I guess I'll need to go with a book that's fiction. And then it occurred to me the things that were happening to me, the twists and turns in my life and career were such that it read more like fiction than a uh, biography might. So I thought, well, maybe not fiction. So what do you do? And I finally came to the conclusion, why not package the book into the chapters outlining the important lessons I learned? And I ended up with 32 chapters, 32 lessons. And in each of the chapters, what I have tried to do is take parts of my life that related to those lessons, how I learned them, the anecdotes that went with them. And that's the way the book is structured. It's a book that you can start in the middle or the back or the front, and it doesn't matter. Each chapter is a standalone, although there is a common thread, I think, that runs through the uh, entire book, and it basically could be said in a very few words that the, the way to success, the important lessons to learn are to build trust, earn respect, and practice open communications. And those are the underlying lessons learned from this book. Lovers Unite, I'm Demetrius Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. In each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. Hey, everybody. <laughs> On today's episode, we're going to be speaking with Charles E. Smith. That name will probably be familiar to a lot of you because he's a pretty high profile political person and he's held a lot of key positions in different industries. So I wouldn't be surprised if you've come across his name at one point or another. Today, Charles is going to be sharing with us his new book entitled Journal of a Fast Track Life, where he talks about his life experiences and the lessons they've taught him along the way. Here's my disclaimer. While Charles is a political figure, we're not going to focus so much on politics. Because he's lived such a unique life, working under governors and presidents and within large institutions. And I think it's more important to get a glimpse of his perspective and hopefully gain something for ourselves in our own life journey. So enjoy this one because it starts right now. Potential repercussions await every decision when you're in a leadership role. Peyton Manning, former superstar pro quarterback, developed an uncanny ability to read opposing defenses at the line of scrimmage. On almost every play, he called one or more audibles before the ball was snapped, changing plays at the last second. It was a skill that effectively gave the Colts and later the Broncos a, quote, coach on the field, end quote. Essentially, Manning had a skill that many successful leaders possess, the ability to look ahead, 
to anticipate what the opposition is likely to do in response to an offensive strategy and to adjust accordingly. With simply a scan down the field, he was able instantly to visualize potential outcomes that unsuccessful quarterbacks fail to see. As a result, Manning minimized mistakes and maximized opportunities to make a play work. Over the years, I have worked for, with, and over literally scores of decision makers at all levels. Those who were successful typically had, to some degree, the Peyton Manning touch. On the other hand, failure generally awaited those who came to the line of scrimmage decision-making with no sense of the need to look down the field and assess the likely incomes and consequences of pending decisions. Make no mistake, for almost any decision, large or small, there will be repercussions, intended or not. A leader has a clear choice each time a decision is made. Assess the upside and downside opportunities and risk and be prepared with secondary options or be blindsided and are trapped by the consequences of a decision. Much has been written about George W. Bush's decision to invade Iraq. It was a fateful decision that effectively paralyzed his administration and to some degree doomed his presidency. Strong evidence suggests that Bush and his advisors were blindly single-minded in their decision to start a war without ever seriously applying the Peyton Manning method of anticipating opposition reaction and having in hand second and third options to deal effectively with whatever was ahead. How does a leader learn to be more like Peyton? My observation is that there is no single way to develop the skills to weigh the potential consequences of a decision and to chart a series of affirmative steps to counteract anticipated reactions of those affected by a decision. I learned the hard way, making lots of mistakes early in my career and spending considerable time second-guessing my own actions. None of my bosses ever critiqued me to the degree that I critiqued myself. Over time, I learned the fundamental truth that for every action, there is a reaction. No decision, large or small, is likely to stand in isolation. Once I recognized that reality, I spent endless hours cultivating the skills to apply the Peyton way to my decision making. In the later years of my professional career, anticipatory decision making became almost automatic for me. Each time I was confronted with a decision, personal or professional, my mind flashed a series of potential repercussions and multiple options for responding and reacting. Decisions that I probably would have made in haste and without regard to consequences when I was younger were made only after a careful assessment had been made of all potential outcomes. A classic example of a success resulting from anticipatory decision-making occurred in my early months as chancellor of the University of Tennessee at Martin. After resolving serious problems in the athletics department, chronicled in an earlier chapter, a second wave of discontent in athletics confronted me in the midst of budget preparations for the next fiscal year. The issue was overspending in the university's football program. In my review of the budget I inherited from my predecessor, I discovered that the football program had regularly been overspending its $400,000 annual budget by about $100,000. This deficit spending had gone unchecked and apparently unnoticed for three years, which was obviously a major contributor to the quarter of a million dollar deficit in the campus budget that I had been commissioned by the university president to clean up. Initially, the issue seemed to be an easy one to explain and correct. We simply directed that the football program was henceforth to live within its budget. However, the head football coach's inability or lack of interest to understand the budgets proved to be a major obstacle. Despite several meetings that I personally conducted with the head coach and numerous other sessions involving our chief fiscal officer and the coaching staff, the head coach stubbornly maintained that the administration was cutting his budget by $100,000. More troubling was the coach's decision to go outside the university to athletic supporters and alumni and spread the word that we were cutting his budget. After several days of time-consuming conversations with concerned supporters of the athletics program, we decided the time had come to halt the coach's shenanigans. In preparation for a showdown meeting, a substantive memorandum was prepared summarizing 
what was being proposed for the football budget, the multiple efforts to explain the situation to the head football coach, and his refusal and our inability to understand that we were not cutting his budget, but simply directing him to live within his established budget. Also, recognizing up front that the coach was popular with the sports media and had a reasonably strong support base among West Tennessee athletic supporters, we planned carefully the agenda for the meeting. The session was scheduled to take place at the chancellor's residence. Joining me for the meeting were members of the university's athletic board executive committee, including the athletics director and the faculty chairman of athletics. We invited the head coach and two of his key assistants. All of us knew that the head football coach was exceedingly impulsive and stubborn. We knew that he was likely to blow up at the meeting and that he might walk out on us. We also knew that if that were to occur, he would rely heavily on his friendly sports writers to make his case, whatever it was, to the public. At the meeting, copies of the memorandum that had been prepared were handed out to all participants. Then I methodically presented verbally each of the points outlined in the memorandum. It was clear from the outset that the head coach was in no mood to listen or understand. He was loudly argumentative and emotional. Then suddenly he stood up, threw his copy of the memorandum to the couch, and walked out of the meeting. As he neared the door, I warned him that if he walked out the door, he was fired. He never looked back as he proceeded out the front door of the chancellor's residence. I told his top assistant that he'd better go after him, which he did, but to no avail. The next morning, True to our expectations, the most prominent daily newspaper in our service area printed a column authored by a sports editor outlining the head coach's version of what had happened at the meeting. No effort had been made by the writer to ask the administration for comment. Having anticipated what might happen, we were prepared to react. A call was placed to the newspaper's editor. Following the conversation, a copy of my memorandum was hand-delivered to the editor. The following day, the newspaper's lead story on the front page was based on the memorandum. The full text was reproduced in the sports section. As expected, the public grasped clearly what the head coach did not. Reason prevailed, and the head coach was out of a job. Anticipatory planning had paid off. As a footnote to the outcome, the following week's Rotary Club meeting produced an interesting surprise that in many ways shaped my chancellorship for the next six years. The club sergeant at arms was a clever and witty fellow who liked to make dramatic announcements about individual members of the club. At this particular meeting, I became his primary mission. He stated to the club members that all of them had wondered for many years who was really in charge at UT at Martin. Now we know, he said, Riley, that we have a chancellor who is in fact in charge. An unfortunate circumstance ironically became a defining moment for me. The incident preceded Peyton Manning's birth but retroactively, it can now be labeled quite accurately as one of those Manning Method moments in my life. I'm guessing it's safe to say you've had a pretty successful career. Well, it, it's a career that I uh, really had, didn't plan. It happened along the way. It's taken a lot of twists and turns. I started out in uh, journalism, and that was my major as an undergraduate, ended up uh, in going to the University of Tennessee to be an administrator. And then I was a press secretary to a Democratic nominee for governor. And uh, then from there went to become chancellor of a couple of UT campuses and then commissioner of education and for the state of Tennessee and uh, then chancellor of the state board of regents. Thought I was retired after 32 years and uh, was retired for about a year and got called to Washington and actually served the last six years of uh, George W. Bush's two terms. You have the unique experiences of entering into several industries, many times starting at the ground level and rising into prominent leadership roles. Have you like <laughs> discovered the Google algorithm for success? Is that your secret? <laughs> I, I've told other people that uh, I wish I'd had this book when I was 20 years old, so I could have followed it, I had to learn the hard way. Yeah, absolutely. And that's pretty common for a lot of folks, especially when you're trying to get from where you are and live to your potential and get as far as you can. And I really have found that, that and I say this in the book, as you probably know, the there are kind of two defining moments or periods in my life. Uh, the first was um, in my first three jobs during the time 
I was in my 20s, and I point out uh, fairly strongly that I, I view that period of your life as foundation building. And I was lucky to have had three different bosses who were uh, as tough as nails. Uh, they were they pushed you as hard as they could. They could uh, put chewing outs on you like it, no one else I've ever seen. Those three men, all three of the men, mm -hmm. but they were also compassionate. They were also caring. I think they took an interest in me, pushed me again as hard as they could. And uh, that was a foundation builder for me because after that, for the rest of my career, I, I, I really felt like I'd already been through boot camp for 10 years. And uh, that helped. And then in, the, in my 30s, as is chronicled in the book with some two or three chapters, uh, uh, we lost the general election when I was press secretary to the uh, Democratic nominee. And so I, I faced a, a significant loss early in my career, and I reflected on that a lot. And at the time, I didn't feel as I do now that uh, those were important factors in my life because it toughened me. Uh, having defeat early in life was better, I think, than, than having to face that. I've seen a lot of people in my life who kind of just really stroll through early parts of their career with nothing but success and then get to the big leagues and suddenly at age 50 or 60, they uh, experience a, a loss and it's more crushing then than I think it was at, the, at my time. So I'm glad it came early. Absolutely. And it's so important to take a time out and really reflect into your experiences so you have a better understanding of what you went through and just make sure that you don't repeat those same mistakes or those same missteps. Exactly. I learned probably more from those two defeats than I did anything else in my life. What would you say were some of the other biggest professional challenges you faced over the years? You know, other than having to answer to governors and, and presidents, because, you know, who really needs that kind of stress? I would say that probably the toughest job I had was the one I value the greatest. And that was during my time as commissioner of education for the state of Tennessee. Uh, I was in that role for seven years. I had not had any previous experience in K through 12. All of my education experience had been in higher ed. And um, I remember when the incoming governor called me, he asked me to be commissioner. I said, Governor, I, I don't know anything about K through 12. He said, I don't either, but we're going to learn together. <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be very true. And yeah, what I had to do to prepare myself for that was I spent the first about 15 months, and I talk about this in the book, uh, going into every school district in the state of Tennessee. At that time, we had 139 school systems, and I would uh, spend an entire day starting out with a breakfast meeting with a group of constituents that uh, might be teachers, might be principals, might be townspeople, school board members. I tried to talk with everybody who had a stake in education, and then I would wind up at the end of the day with the town hall meeting open to anybody, I learned more in that 15 months than I suspect uh, uh, anyone who's ever been in that position learned. And I had to do it, though, in order to uh, get a feel for what are real people thinking about what we need to do in education. From that, my staff and I put together a comprehensive plan. It was based almost entirely on uh, what we learned. And we passed that bill. I believe it was in the third year of the governor's uh, first administration. And uh, it passed, uh, changed almost everything about K through 12. And we did it in a, in a way that was um, uh, not partisan. Uh, we were, I worked for a Democratic governor. I'd earlier worked for a Republican governor. And then after that, as I said, worked with uh, uh, George Bush's team in Washington with the nation's report card. And the, back in those days, unlike what we're seeing so much of in recent years, uh, we had in Tennessee a, a respect for one another. We, the chairman of the uh, Senate Education Committee was a Republican. He and I met almost every day for two or three years while we were building the plan. Uh, we had public hearings, and I don't remember a single moment when we had a partisan disagreement. Now, we disagreed on a lot of policy issues, which we later found ways to accommodate, but they, not once did we ever get into a partisan Republican-Democratic uh, philosophy debate. Um, I think that probably one other piece of my life that 
fits into this book pretty well is you can't really chart too carefully where you think you want to be because there are twists and turns that take place. And I've had that happen to me in, in many times. And, and I have one, one of the more interesting chapters, I think in the book, at least to me mm-hmm. is a story of how in 24 hours I was turned from one direction to another. I was offered the position of editor of the Nashville banner, a daily newspaper mm-hmm. uh, and the chancellorship of another university of Tennessee campus. And I would, had made my decision I was going to take the job at the University of Tennessee. And uh, as I chronicle in the book, uh, my wife and I were invited to go to a dinner with the three new owners of the Nashville Banner, uh, just the eight of us, private party. And I was prepared to tell the publisher the next day that I was going to UT instead of going to the Banner. And the, the three owners got up after the meal, before the dessert, went out of the room, stayed about 10 minutes, came back in, and the publisher, who, had, who was a candidate that I worked for 10 years before, held up a glass of champagne and said, let's propose a toast to the new editor of the Nashville Banner. Mm-hmm. And that turned our world upside down. And and my wife and I talked about it overnight, woke up the next morning and decided, well, maybe it was uh, to be that we be, go in, back into the newspaper business. And uh, so instead of going to, uh, to the Nashville Banner, to tell the owner I was not going there, but we'd be going to UT. We instead drove to Knoxville and had to tell the president of the university that we had made the decision to go with the banner. It was one of those twists. No one could have predicted that. Right. But you have to have that flexibility, especially when opportunities present themselves like that. I, I think you do. And the same thing happened when, when I was asked to go to the Bush administration being identified as a Democrat and being from the state of Tennessee where Al Gore was from, uh, when I was approached, I said, no, wait a minute, uh, you and I are friends. Uh, what chance is there that the Bush administration would be interested at all in someone from Tennessee who worked for a Democratic governor? And uh, and the answer was, well, it may cause a little heartburn. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, it might be more than that. But It never once did I have a partisan disagreement there either. And the chairman of the board was someone who was very close to the Bush family. And in fact, uh, he's now 88 years old. And I sent him a manuscript before it was published. And he has written a a blurb on the back of the book. He's one of the three people who, uh, who wanted to say some things about the book and embrace it. And I think that's another key of success, being able to not only identify and take an opportunity, but sometimes you find yourself just a bit above your comfort zone and you have to figure out how to shred water, how to swim in that condition and how to adapt yourself to maximize your success. You said that better than I say it in the book. (laughs) I couldn't agree more. Well, you know, what I really like about your book is the fact that you have these lessons and you also accent them and highlight them with the experiences that you've gone through to make them relatable. But what I kept asking myself is, how did you know what you wanted to add or what you wanted to keep in and what you were going to leave out? Because, I mean, to condense a lifetime into, you know, 300 pages can be a pretty big challenge. It is. And and that was was truly, as you suggest, uh, probably the biggest challenge that I faced in putting this book together. And and the way I by, de- by deciding to go with 32 chapters I found that there were a lot of stories, a lot of things that I wanted to say, but I didn't think they fit under any of the 32 chapters. So that was one thing that troubled me a bit. And also, since I published the book, almost every day I think of another thing that happened in my life that would have fit under one of these chapters, and uh, I wish I'd put it in. So it it was a a screening process that uh, forced me to leave out some stuff that frankly, I think might have been interesting. Maybe a second book. (laughs) But how did you decide on what chapters would be in the book initially? Well, that's that's an interesting question, too. And and, uh, there was not a magic formula for that. But uh, uh, I really tried to think, okay, what are the lessons? And there's one that's a little unorthodox, I guess you might say, about an experience that happened when I was at boot camp at Lackland Air Force Base. That one came late to me. I'd, it, it had been on my mind a lot over the years, and it, it's a story about what occurred when I went through the obstacle course 
uh, while one day at Lackland Air Force Base and it involved a, a burning house that you were forced to go into, smoke filled, you couldn't see your way, and then you had to find your way out of the building. And when I came out of the building, I heard these male voices saying, here we go around the mulberry bush. Hmm. And I thought, well, I'm hallucinating. Maybe that smoke got to me. And then when I cleared my eyes, I saw these three very athletic looking guys, all of them six, four and above, uh, holding hands around a mulberry bush. And there was this drill sergeant who was chewing them out up and down using a lot of words I could not use in this interview. <laughs> and I looked at them, and, I, and then I saw what was happening. There was a cliff there. The next obstacle was a, about a three-story cliff with a rope dangling down, and the obstacle was to climb up that rope. And I, even though this happened more than 50 years ago, I can still visualize that now, and I've had it pop up in my mind, almost every obstacle of any consequence. I, I thought that moment, I said, look, I got a choice. I'm either going to climb that rope or I'm going to be holding hands with these guys. And I didn't want to sing. Here we go around the mulberry bush. <laughs> and uh, so I climbed it, made it and didn't look back. And again, I've thought of that many, many times as I've run up against the obstacles. And I tell my kids and grandkids, don't ever give up and don't ever get caught around the mulberry bush. <laughs> That's a pretty good incentive. Well, that was one probably if, if I had finished the book 10, 12 years ago, I might not have thought about putting that in. But I thought there's a I think there is an important lesson there for and it certainly impacted my life. One of the chapters that stood out to me was third decade of life crucial to career, because that's where I'm at right now. I'm 38. What would you say was some of the most memorable lessons for you within the book? Uh, uh, my very first job was uh, one that paid the lowest of the, of the four jobs I was offered when I got out of, of school. And uh, I picked it because the newspaper publisher had just bought the paper, and he was a an award-winning, a nationally recognized newspaper editor who was in the later parts of his career. He'd been editor of the Tennessean for many, many years. And uh I saw in him someone that would give me a mentor opportunity. I give a lot of attention to, to going into work environments where you can find mentors who are going to be able to help you in that job, but more importantly, help you in later jobs. And it was a small pond, but it was a big opportunity to, to learn how to operate in the real world. And also being at a small town newspaper, uh, I knew that I would make a lot of mistakes and it was better to make them in a small environment than it would be if you tried to jump into a big job early. And so that helped. And then that boss pointed me in the direction of the second boss. And that person then became a mentor. And then the third person I worked for was uh, uh, Mr. John J. Hooker, who was uh, a well-known figure. And those three men, they were helping me. I'd go to them, get advice. They pointed me in directions of jobs. And almost every position that I had from that point on in some way related to either what I learned from them or what they did to open the door for me. I think you hit on two very crucial points. You mentioned your network, your professional network, which is key to receiving opportunities. But then you also spoke about having mentors because it's really difficult when you're out there and there's no manual for life and you're trying to figure out best decisions or the right things to do. And it's nice to have someone that you can go to and, and ask these things, someone who's kind of been there or at least can relate to what you're going through. And I think a lot of folks are missing that. I, I agree with that. And that's one reason why I thought that was so important. And it, it, if you ask me the question of what is probably the most emotional chapter in my book, it is uh, the one that dealt with the relationship between the, the candidate for governor that I worked for, the one who lost, and the person who beat him, and how they developed a friendship that was over 40 years in length and very close. And having been in a political setting most of my life, I know, and I, it's pretty obvious that uh, most of what you see on the stage and on TV, where politicians are talking how much they like each other and respect one another, it's mostly phony, I think. I, I've seen so much of that. It's just a show. But in this relationship, and I, I had a front row seat early and a front row seat all the way to the 
time that one of the two men died about two years ago. And I write about that uh, in, in great detail about how it developed and what it evolved into. And it was very interesting to me that uh, here, here was a guy, uh, Winfield Dunn, who came out of nowhere and upset us. We lost the election by less than a percentage point. He became governor, and the man I worked for had his life is effectively shattered from a political standpoint and even a professional standpoint. Mm. And yet they were, they respected one another. They were true friends. And the proof of that came when, when Mr. Hooker died two years ago. There was a service, a memorial service, but then week before that, Mr. Hooker's brother hosted a very small, intimate group of of people at his home. There were only 25 people there. And when I walked into the home, first two people I saw were Winfield Dunn and his wife, Betty. And I thought that's all anybody needs to know that uh, among such intimate friends, they were the closest and there was nothing phony about it. I sent the manuscript to Mr. Dunn. He's still living. He's 92 now. Mm. And uh, he wrote me back and said that he read the chapter three or four times. And he said, each time I read it, I I weeped. He said, it it touched my heart. And and the point of my story as it relates to your question is that uh, friendships are, are not just, they just don't happen. You have to really work at it. Uh, I, I've seen people who have been in political power, like Governor Dunn was, who might have been very vindictive toward me because I had to go back to the University of Tennessee. I've been on leave. He could have made life miserable for me, but he was a friend from the beginning. And you, and obviously the proof's in the pudding. His inscription's on the back of my book. Absolutely. Because you've taken readers through your life journey from the beginning up until this point, I feel like there is something here for every age group. But what lessons would the you of today share with the young 20-year-old you from yesterday? I think that, uh, and that's a good question, and I thought about that question a lot. What I tried to do in the book is answer the question you just asked. What would I have liked to have known when I was 20 years old? And that's basically the book. And uh, as I said earlier, I I think that... uh, I, I wish I'd had the book when I was 20 and maybe I wouldn't have had to stumble along the way and make the mistakes that I made and uh, would have been better prepared. <laughs> I think we all wish that. But that's also the uh, the process of life. You know what I mean? It is. It, it really is. And and I've, I've, I've been really uh, rewarded with a good, rich life and uh, a lot of experiences and uh, uh, somebody even one interview, I guess I had the other day said, your head must be spinning from all these different paths you have taken. And <laughs> uh, that's true. <laughs> well, what's next for you? Because you certainly don't seem like you're slowing down anytime soon. Well, I'm, uh, my, my wife is really pushing me to write another book. We're going to take some time off and go spend about a month at the beach in, in January and I'm going to try to focus that time on deciding, OK, what kind of book should I do? I enjoy writing. It's a great pleasure and rewarding to do that. I, I think there's still the journalist in me, even though I've been away from it a long time. And uh, so there may be a, another book. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I am permanently retired. I, I've retired twice before and got, got called back in, the last one being with uh, the Bush administration. And I, I think I can say no the next time if that should ever come. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can readers go to learn more about you, your experiences and your book online? Both Amazon and Barnes and Noble have it. Uh, it's also available as an ebook with Amazon and uh, it's available at Parnassus Bookstore in Nashville, uh, both online and in, in the bookstore. And they're at the University of Tennessee Martin Bookstore. I've done a book signing there within the last week and it's available there. But Amazon and Barnes and Noble, for those who may live in other states, one of those two would be the best route to go. Do you have a website also? Yes, it is. It's uh, char- charbarpress.com. Let's spell that. C-H-A-R-B-A-R-P-R-E-S-S dot com. Thank you. 
And with that, we're going to wrap up another episode. Thanks again to Charles and for the lessons he was able to share with us today. You'll definitely want to pick up his book because there's a lot more to be gained from his experiences. If you have a question or comment for him or for me, or you know an author who you think would be a good fit for the show, let me know. Connect with me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or send an email to info at ch1podcast.com. Check out our website at ch1podcast.com. We're there. You can listen to previous episodes and hopefully find your next favorite author. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overcast, basically wherever podcasts can be downloaded. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review. And most importantly, tell everyone you know about the show, because that is how we grow. Uh, I always forget to mention, I do have a YouTube channel where I upload podcast interviews, videos about my books, ask me anything videos where I answer your literary questions, and a lot of other cool things. So don't forget to subscribe. And you can also become a Patreon supporter by clicking the link in the show notes or going to patreon.com and searching for CH1 Podcast. Okay, I think that's it for me. (laughs) You all stay awesome. Till next time.